Uh, welcome everyone to our second uh, SOFI thematic conference. This time the topic is um, inflation risk and we have as as the last time two speakers um, for today they are Marco Del Negro and Selim Bahaj and two discussants, two corresponding discussants, Felipe Andrade and Eric um, Laulish. And the format is going to be like last time. So it's a 40 minutes for the speaker, followed by 50 minutes of um, presentations. Uh, sorry, dis a discussion and um, five minutes we reserve for um, for questions from the audience. So the way to ask to ask questions is through the Q and A box. Um, and um, time permitting, we, we would like we would um, facilitate asking as many questions um, as possible. Uh, the event is recorded and the recording is usually posted um, slightly after the event, shortly after the event um, is finished. Um, and so today, given the length of the of the whole event, two hours, um, we will not have any informal Q&A session as we usually did during the se usual seminars. Um, so if you do have any questions, please uh, post them in the Q&A box. Um, and all the speakers will be able to see those questions. So even in the event that we don't get to ask them, uh, they can always see them. Okay, our well, first speaker is uh, Marco. Uh, Marco, would you like to share your slides? And Marco will be talking about um, a Bayesian perspective on inference in um, survey forecasts. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Katja. And thank you to all the organizers for, for inviting me to, um, to present in this, in this really nice series. Um, the paper that I'm going to present is joint with uh, Roberto Casarin from Venice and Federico Bassetti from the Politecnico in Milan. And whatever I'm going to see are my views um, and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Again, the title of this paper um, is a Bayesian approach for inference on probabilistic surveys. And the application is going to be, as I just said, it's at the risk. So what are we going to do here? Um, the paper has two contributions, and I'll spend about the, the same time, uh, half the time on one and half the time on the other. There is a methodological contribution, which we hope it's important, uh, um, which amounts to providing a new approach to conduct inference on probabilistic surveys. And then there is an application where um, we test the noisy rational expectation hypothesis using density projections. So in particular, using cycle moments from the US Survey of Professional Forecasters using data from 82 to 2021. And the point of the application is that, you know, uh, with probabilistic surveys, you just don't have obviously information about point forecast first moments, but also about second moments and in principle, higher moments as well. There is a lot of literature testing rational expectations using first moments from surveys, but to our knowledge, known so far on second moments, and that's, that's where we come in. So uh, the inference problem. What's the inference problem? The problem is that each forecasters, they don't give you their subjective probabilistic distribution from which you can compute variance, you know, cortosis, or whatever moments you're interested in. They give you probabilities, which we're gonna call Z, Z-I, I is a forecaster, on uh, cup J bins. And that probability measures the, the, the likelihood that a continuous variable of, that, that they're asked to forecast, say in this case is gonna be output growth or inflation, is going to fall within those J bins where the first and the last bin are going to be open. So, you know, for concreteness, let me give you a few examples. The top row, shows for two different forecasters, forecast for output growth in 2020, so the year of COVID, made the year before, and particularly in the second quarter of the year before, okay? 
Um, so you you see the bins. The bins there are start here at minus three, minus two, minus one, blah blah blah, right up until six. And so they have to report for probability that output is going to be less than minus three. Okay. So the, these two guys are asked the, the same question, and then below you have forecast for inflation, the other variable that we were going to study. In 2009, so right after the Great Recession, made uh, you know uh, uh, basically the quarter that Lehman struck. Okay, so what do you see from this uh, from these plots? And by the way, interrupt me or I guess write in Q and A if you have any any clarification question even during the presentation, and I'll try to address them right away. What do you see from these plots? Well, first of all. There, you know, these two people are forecasting the same object. Output growth the year after. Clearly, there is a lot of it originating. They don't agree on the forecast distribution. And likewise, these two people forecasting the same object, they have extremely different views. Okay, point one. Two, often non-Gaussian. I mean, this is a bimodal distribution, so clearly not very Gaussian. This is doesn't look that Gaussian either. Okay, second point. Third point, there's a lot of zero and a lot of rounding. So for instance, this individual think that there is some chance about 20% that output growth is gonna be between minus two and minus one. And then some chance that it's gonna be positive and like zero chance in between. The question is, so how, how are we going to interpret this as like, literally zero or does she think that the probability do they think that the probability is small enough that they report zero and similarly there is a lot of rounding if you look at this number they are 0 0.2 0 0.5 0 0.3 you know and so they seem to round toward integers okay and then the last point that i want to really stress is that th sometimes there is a lot of mass and in this case 80% of the mass on the open bin. Okay. So the inference problem from the perspective of the, of, of, of the information. So what am I interested in? I'm interested in measuring, say, the uncertainty, the variance that these guys express. And the way to do that, the way that the whole literature has done it up to this point, and we continue to follow that, the um, uh, th that approach is to try to back out an underlying distribution that, that underlies, that generate those probabilities on the bins, which we're going to call F, a Y, Y is a variable, theta is the parameters of the underlying distribution. We back it out and then ask, okay, once we have it, we can compute whatever moments we want to compute and we're going to focus on the circuit. Oh, yeah. What's been the approach so far in the literature? The following. You basically pick one parametric CDF, F, which, you know, the most popular approach is the beta from the paper by Engelberg, Musk, and Williams. But, you know, another popular approach is a normal from Jordani and Sutherland, Clement has written a number of papers um, on this. Um, and just, you know, choose the parameters of that beta or of that normal so as to minimize basically the deviations from the cumulated F, from the, from the, from the CDF of the F and the, the cumulated beans probabilities, okay? As, as you can readily imagine, there are two issues with this approach, arguably. One, is that the underlying F may be misspecified. So, you know, you are assuming a normal. Those guys are, the underlying F is not normal. Clearly, you get the wrong answer. And second, that even if it were correctly misspecified, you know, you, you kind of neglect by just choosing one parameter, inference uncertainty. which, as I will show in a second, is pretty big. We are going to try to um, propose a new approach, as I said, which is going to be non-parametric. 
And the no parametric has two advantage, um, as I'll explain later, both flexibility, right? That's the no parametric part, but also pooling, which will be able to deliver us some consistency result. And the second point, we're going to try to account for inference uncertainty. Here's how the Bayesian no parametric works, which is basically each Z, each collection, each data point, is up, distributed according to an a priori, potentially infinite mixture of kernel distributions. So what the Beecher so far has done is basically assume one kernel, we assume a potentially infinite mixture of these kernels. So I'm gonna first describe how we build the kernel, which we're gonna do something different than what the literature has done so far, and then discuss the Bayesian non parametric. Okay, so how do we build the kernel? The kernel itself is given by a hierarchical model. So what we have in mind is that for each forecaster, there, they, they, there is an underlying predictive distribution F that determines the probabilities news associated with the bins. So, you know, if you go back to the earlier plot with the blue line that was the, the, the F, you know, that, that the blue line is, is what forecasters are using to, to, to associate probabilities with the bins. In our application, um, but that has nothing to do with a consistency result. Any F applies for those. We use a mixture of two Gaussian distributions as, as our underlying F. Okay. And then we postulate that the forecasters are not reporting the news because the news are number like 0.2345. So instead, they are reported rounded version of the news, which can be rounded towards zeros if the news is very small, or rounded around some other number, which is which is determined by a, a rounded or, or you know uh, uh, or kind of the the the, the um, what they may report is some, some other number which is determined by a Dirichlet distribution that which is add, adds noise to the news if the 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 news is, is they decide not to report as zero okay um so that's the idea right so if the underlying news is really small less than two percent basically they're most likely they're going to report zero if it's higher than five percent then they're most likely they're going to report something something some something positive Okay, and and this is like gives you a sense of the noise that we allow, you know, around positive number, which is like plus or minus five percent, roughly speaking. Okay, so this is a kernel, just one kernel. So the literature so far, by the way, the literature kind of ignored the noise part, which we explicitly, or the rounding, which we explicitly model. But other than that, you know, it focus on one kernel. We just different in that in the in the, in the choice of the kernel, the, the the use of the of the mixture of two normals. Well, so as such, we could be just as me specified as the previous literature. What we add though is the use of Bayesian non parametric, that is allowing for an inf potentially infinite mixture of these kernels to fit our distribution. How does that work? Well, you're certainly familiar with a mixture distribution. So basically the mixture means that among forecasters, there can be a variety of types, you know, high variance, low variance, high mean for inflation, low, 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 low mean for inflation, and so on. Lots of noise, little noise, lots of rounding, little rounding. Okay. Now, so you have these mixtures, right? So what we could do is to fit a finite mixture distribution. What the Bayesian non-parametric does is that it, it fits a potentially infinite mixture representation. And what that means in practice 
is that the number of mixtures that you're going to fit in practice is going to fit something finite because you have a finite number of, of, of data points that you're fitting it to a finite number of forecasters. But the number of mixtures for a given number of forecasters is endogenous and depends on the heterogeneity across forecasters. So that's point number one. And point number two is that, you know, th these weights of this mixture a priori, there is something called a stick breaking distribution, which means that um, there is kind of a, a, a prior that enforces this weight to be mostly concentrated on one mixture. What mixture that is, the, that, that, that the data will speak to that, but it, it, it enforces some degree of pooling. And that is extremely important because such pooling means that as the number of forecasters goes to infinity, you have less mixture than forecasters. And in fact, again, as that number goes to infinity, you'll have enough forecaster per mixture that put weights on, on, on one mixture so that you have enough data to nail the parameters of that mixture and you get consistency. Okay. And so asymptotic properties, as, as I just said, as a number of forecasters, observation goes to infinity, the posterior distributions over disease is weakly consistent for given beans. And so what this means is that, you know, even if we screw up in terms of our kernel, right, it's not exactly a mixture of two normals, the noise is not exactly Dirichlet, we still have consistency. And that's obviously very important to have a, a, robust, a robust conclusion. Now, I should stress that what we have is consistency over the data generating process over the Z's. Over the stuff that we are interested in, such as the, you know, the variance, for instance, of the F, the F itself, we're not gonna have consistency just because the information that we have is limited. We only have, you know, uh, um, probabilities over the bins, and there are many F in principle that can fit those bins. So we have another result, which is interesting, maybe theoretically, not so much in practice because we have a we have very few beans in general. That it, as the number of beans goes to infinity and the beans get thinner and thinner, then basically we can nail the F. But again, this is a theoretical result, which I guess is good for our approach. You know, if under ideal condition our approach is 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 meant to, you know, delivers what we want. But we should remember that in terms of making inference on the F, you know, we, we, we cannot claim to be consistent. Okay. Um, right, and then, you know, basically there is, the, the, there are standard approaches to doing deep samplers with this, with this um, Bayesian and parametric models. And you know we fully espouse the uncertainty. So you know we we have the distributions of these parameters, and whatever object of interest, say the variance of the f, we use it computing the whole the whole distribution. Sounds great. Uh, the priors. You know there are a few parameters. What all I'm going to say about the priors is that. We use exactly the same prior throughout the whole sample. So our sample goes from 82 from the 80s where inflation was 10% to 2021 where inflation is again <laughs> almost 10%. And, and uh, you know, but obviously uh, was much lower before. So we use the same prior throughout and the very same prior for inflation and output. So no, no difference. And, you know, we, you, we'll see that, that we find that the procedure to be very robust uh, to this. Okay, let me give you a few, uh, quickly a few, um, go back to the examples that I showed earlier and, and tell you how our approach differs from what has been done before. 
let's start with the, the top panel. So here is the histogram that I showed you earlier. On the middle, in the middle column, I'm showing the PDF. The little thin gray lines are our approach. And again, as I said, you know, we, we incorporate uncertainty. And so I'm showing all, you know, all basically a, a, a thousand rows from our from our procedure distribution. And on the right hand side, I'm showing the CDF for the same object where the crosses are the cumulated zetas, okay? And here, you know, the, the histogram are the, the same thing as this. On top of this, I'm also gonna show you what the Gaussian distribution, you know, this, you see this line here, this is what you would get with a Gaussian distribution. And this dash and dotted line is what you would get with a beta distribution. I mean, not the beta distribution is bounded, by the way. Not very surprisingly, but you know that that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a cheap shot. You know, in the case of bimodality, both the Gaussian and the beta are completely off the mark. You know, they don't fit the CDF, and clearly they don't fit the PDF either. Okay. Um. In cases, however, like this, where the distribution is closer to Gaussian, and, and so the, 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 the yeah, uh, um, we're going to get very similar answers, except that we, you know, our approach includes the uncertainty about the, uh, um, about the theta, which the other procedure don't get. The other point, yes, the other point that I want to get is that the very strong difference, and that matters when, when we're talking about inflation uncertainty, of how we deal with the open bins. Right? For instance, in this case, both it turns out that both the beta and, and, the, and the Gaussian like chop off the open bins big time, right? The, the, the beta subs here, the Gaussian doesn't go much further. In our approach instead, you know, we fully incorporate the fact that this person is putting 80% of the mass on the open bin, we really have very little information therefore about the left tail and that's characterized here in this, in this, um, in our procedure distribution. Okay. And he said that, I have about 15 minutes, right? Um, so let me finally talk about some of the results. What I am going to show you now is the evolution of subjective uncertainty by individual respondent, starting with output growth. So what I'm sure, uh, output growth. These are the, the projection for output growth next year, conducted in say 1982, second quarter. I'm picking the second quarter, but these plots are about the same no matter what quarter you, you look, of the year you're looking at. By the way, this, this SPF is done four times a year. In, in, um, so this is the second quarter. Okay. The crosses, the little crosses here, are the posterior mean of the subjective uncertainty for each of the forecaster. They are connected by thin gray lines whenever the forecaster remains the same from one survey to the next. And the point of this thin gray line is, well, the fact that they're not flat. And those these fellows change their mind, sometimes quite substantially, between one period to the next. And then finally, I am also showing you the average subjective uncertainty across forecaster. This is the, the thick dash black line. Okay, so what's, what points do I want to make? A, there is huge variation in subjective uncertainty across forecasters. I mean, just look at this number. I'm plotting standard deviations, by the way, right? You know, and, and this person is a standard deviation below one. This is like three times two times as much. Okay. Second, as I said, this forecaster change your mind quite, quite, quite a bit. 
And we're going to use that, those changes within forecasters um, later on in our, some of our panel regressions. And finally, there is some average change over time. I mean, if you look at the average, you kind of see the great moderation. You see that, you know, the average uncertainty about output growth was higher here and then goes down in the 90s and then ups goes stepwise up, which is interesting, after the Great Recession. Um, we suggest, suggested that some of the risk there um, is, you know, remains in the mind of the forecasters. And then again, goes up, not too surprisingly weak with the with COVID. Okay, so that was output, and here is inflation again, huge uncertainty, lots of changes within forecasters as well, and now you see, you know, a, a, a stronger change in the average over time in the average inflation uncertainty. You know, it's kind of higher, not surprisingly, in the eighties and then goes down in the 90s as the Fed arguably keeps inflation under control, remains flat for a period, and then goes down, you know, I mean, it, it, what, what, when charitable interpretation is that this is the period that where the, the Fed adopted um, basically inflation targeting and a long run goal of 2% for core PC. And then what's really interesting is that even during 2021, for the day, year after, it stays low. There's no increase in subjective uncertainty during the COVID period. The mean in this period goes bananas, right? They're not foolish. They, they understand that expected inflation has gone up. But their subjective uncertainty, you know, really not much happens. On the, it goes up only a little bit. Okay. This is just, I want to make the point that since we conduct inference uncertainty on, on all the objects that we talked about, I can, we can put bands and we, conduct, we can conduct tests. Uh, but I don't want to, uh, since I have a, a little more than 10 minutes, I want to move to testing the noisy rational expectation hypothesis. So the noisy rational expectation hypothesis as being a needed hypothesis for some explaining some facts about point prediction from survey and, and leading authors are, are, are um, Olivier Coibion and Yuri Gorodnichenko. There has been a lot of work testing the noisy rational expectation hypothesis and also the work of Genagnoli et al. and, and other uh, callers and so on. All that work using point prediction to my knowledge. And what we're going to ask here is how does the noisy rational expectation do for density prediction? And in particular, what we're going to focus on is second moment. Now, in principle, the noisy rational expectation hypothesis can explain the heterogeneity that I showed you a couple of slides ago. You know, there are some forecasters that have a very noisy signal and that will therefore have very high subjective uncertainty. And then some forecaster have a much less noisy, you know, much more precise signal and will have less subjective uncertainty. So that heterogeneity is accounted for by the theory the catch, however, is that it has to be the case and the rational expectation that those forecasters with higher subjective uncertainty, precisely because they have a noisier signal, they must make on average worse forecast errors. So rational expectation implies that there has to be a mapping between subjective uncertainty and exposed forecastability. And this mapping is precisely what we're gonna test here. We're gonna do it in two ways. One, what we're gonna call like a scale test, where we show, where we test whether on average, basically, subjective at the denominator and objective square forecast errors 
are going to be aligned. And so whether this alpha Q is going to be equal to one using the whole panel. Okay. And then a variation test. So this is just on average, right? On average, basically another word that, 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 that the VTRO has used for this kind of test is overconfidence or underconfidence. Okay. Then the second test is going to be a variation test. If, which is going to look at the follow. If my forecasting uncertainty changes, right, I become more uncertain, more uncertain from one period to the next, or a cross forecaster, if you are more uncertain than me, then will you have higher um, forecast errors? Okay, does this thing map one to one? into forecast error as, as, as it changes over time or across forecasters. So let me start with a scale test. So the overconfidence. Here, okay, let me tell you what we show. <laughs> um, since we have four service per year and we ask forecast for the next year and as well as the as the current year right so basically we have like eight forecast horizon these forecast horizon is done by q in this regression and this is what's plotted on the on the on the x-axis here and here for a given forecast horizon here is eight quarters ahead our forecasts are on average overconfidence or underconfidence. And you know, these are the, 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 the panel estimates with robust standard of errors. So what we show is that at long horizons, these forecasters are overconfidence. They're very overconfident for output with you know, uh, like a, 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 a coefficient of three. So basically they overestimate by 300%, just a big number. They're, they're, um, the, 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 uh, they underestimate by 300% the, you know, the, the, their ability to forecast output growth or inflation eight quarters ahead. Um, but as the forecast horizon nears, um, you know, from overconfidence, they actually become, if anything, underconfident. And that's, that's true for, for both output and inflation, okay? Uh, these are the results for the full sample from 82 to 2021, so it includes COVID. The results for different samples, um, you know, shorter, uh, stopping before COVID, you can cut it in a variety of ways and we do that in the paper. In, in general, they are very similar. Maybe these numbers are a little different, but other than that, they stay the same, okay? Now, you know, this is what we get with our approach. What if we use the beta? Well, with the beta distribution, because uh, you know you kind of you know the beta is 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 chopped off is bounded so especially when there is a lot of probability on the open bins that's being chopped off so you arguably underestimate subjective uncertainty and then you find that the the amount of of overconfidence is you know twice as much like six per 600% um, in, in this case, and you don't find any, any, any underconfidence at short horizon, which we do find instead with, a, with, a, with our approach. Okay. So, you know, what's new in this report so, in the results so far? Well, I mean, we kind of knew from the work of Clements and others that forecasters tend to be overconfident, uh, but the you know the Clements does something akin to this test forecaster by forecaster. But for each forecaster, you have about you know on average 10, 12 observation at most. So you don't have a lot of power. And I think it's nice to do the full you know panel regression and explicitly test the noisy rational expectation. On top of that, you know using if you use the beta. You're, you're, 
as I said, you're going to get quite different results that are very different from what we find. Okay. And now with the other test, which I'm going to call the variation test, which tests whether differences in subjective uncertainty, either across forecasters or over time, map into differences in forecast accuracy. The results are arguably pretty striking in the following sense, that for long forecast horizons, so eight, seven, six quarters ahead, basically for output growth, there is no relationship whatsoever between subjective uncertainty and ex post forecast accuracy. So basically, you know, what it says is that these guys make change your assessment of the, uh, of, of, you know, uh, of their uncertainty about the economy. Whatever they report has got nothing to do with their ability to forecast for a long horizon. However, for a short horizon, they nail it. So when they change their mind, about their ability to forecast out what, a couple of quarters down the road, they have it. It maps one to one, almost, and then one exactly for one, one quarter ahead for um, um, uh, um, on, on forecasting accuracy. For inflation, they're not as bad, but they're still pretty bad and for a longer horizon, but then again, it goes to one. Okay, now these results that I just showed you, so you cannot reject the rational expectation of short horizons. These results that I just showed you encompass both changes across forecasters, which as you saw earlier, they're huge, and over time. So we can use fixed effect to tell one from the other. So if we have just time fixed effect, we're going to just focus on the changes across forecasters. And what we see is that basically the, the same thing holds. There is very little relationship. So forecasters that are more uncertain about output growth, they're not gonna forecast any worse than forecasters that are more, more, more certain for longer horizon, but they do, you know, not quite one, but it is one for inflation for short horizons. Perhaps even more interesting is when we actually have a forecaster fix effect. And so we look at whether, you know, these guys change their mind about the probability of a recession, whether they're uncertain to go up. Are they able to forecast recessions? Are they able to forecast periods of higher uncertainty? And for long forecast horizon, zero. These guys have no clue about future uncertainty in the economy. And it's about the same for inflation. But for, for, for short horizon, they nail it. And by the way, when we have both time and forecaster effect, those, these are the, the change within forecasters, you know, again, the same is the same is true. Um, I'm almost, almost done, Katya, so just give me a couple of minutes to just do slides. So arguably, these results are very new to the literature. I don't know of anything like that. that it has been done before. And I hope that you find them interesting in the following sense, that you know, if we could reject rationality, if those guys were like really bad at all horizons, then we say, you know, they just they, these density forecasts are just garbage. Uh, there's not much we can learn from that. But that's not true. The, the rationality it cannot be rejected on the horizon. For long horizons, yes, there's not a lot there. Um, for, but for shorter horizons, you know, they become more ra rational. And uh, the patterns, by the way, are very similar across output growth and inflation. Um, so there's got to be, it looks like something fundamental about the forecast of horizon, which I think it would be interesting to explore using models. And then, you know, I guess this result bring to my, you know, uh, cast some question about the usefulness of reporting 
survey uncertainty, right? So my colleagues, for instance, at the survey of consumer expectation in New York Fed, you know, they plot every period, uh, you know, they tell you how uncertain is going up, uncertain is going down at the, so, uh, you know, for inflation, say, uh, at the three years ahead horizon. I mean, you know, these results suggest that even for professional forecasters, they have no clue. So, you know, it's, it would be interesting to study whether whether consumers or households have a, have a better clue. But so far, you know, the, 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 the fact that these guys can forecast economic uncertainty is really a longer horizon is very much called into question. So let me conclude. Um, we propose a Bayesian non-parametric approach to conduct inference and probability surveys. We apply our approach to the SPF and we test whether these projections, you know, on cycle moments are consistent with the noisy rational expectation hypothesis. We find that uh, in contrast with the theory, for horizons close to two years, there is no relationship whatsoever between subjective uncertainty and forecast accuracy, both across forecasters and over time. And on the MI relation or inflation projection, however, has the horizon shorter, the relationship becomes one to one as theory predicts. Thank you. You're muted, Katya, at least to me. Thanks, Marco, uh, very much for your talk. There are currently no questions from the audience, so we can proceed to the discussion straight away. Um, yes, Felipe, if, yeah, if you can see your slides, yeah, please. Yes, uh, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for uh, the invitation to, to discuss uh, this paper. Um, I very much uh, enjoyed reading it. It's always a pleasure to read uh, Marco's work. Uh, and the usual uh, disclaimer applies. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, there's um, a huge amount of uh, papers that use uh, uh, survey data, but they, most of them use uh, point forecast. Uh, uh, and this has been, you know, applied in different uh, for different topics, like uh, assessing uh, the forecast performances of uh, this uh, survey. It's uh, quite a well-known feature that it's hard to beat the consensus that is the average of this point forecast of professional forecasters. It's also something that has been used to discuss how expectations are formed, in particular, as Marco has alluded to, um, you know, to document deviations from full information rational expectations, and you know what could be the alternative model. It's also something that is used to discuss the credibility of the central bank, in particular, of long-term inflation expectation and whether there are risk to, uh, the, uh, to, to the target and the risk to see uh, the anchoring of inflation expectation in the long term. Um, and also, there's a lot of work who try to understand what drives the heterogeneity in the, uh, in the beliefs and so in this uh, point forecast, what are the determinants of this heterogeneity, uh, what is the impact of uh, this heterogeneity on financial market outcomes or in macro outcomes, okay? But there's much less uh, use of probabilistic surveys, uh, which uh, this paper is going to, to do. Would, and, and this is, um, you know, uh, this is somehow a, a, a limit in the literature because, you know, the use of the, those probabilistic surveys can be uh, useful to, to address uh, questions that are also key, at least uh, for uh, people working in the central bank. Uh, so for instance, the, how do you measure uh, uh, macro uncertainty and the perceived macro uncertainty? Uh, what are the determinants of macro uncertainty? What is the balance of risk? You know, uh, are risk to the upside uh, more important than risk to the downside? And more generally, and the paper does a bit, uh, Marco's paper does a bit of that too, you know, uh, how uh, the density of uh, of uh, the density of uh, forecasts uh, or forecast density, how can they be used to uh, tell us something about the rationality of of beliefs and you know pick up other topics where um, <clears throat> those probability surveys could be informative. So maybe one reason why it's not been so much used that because it's uh, 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 it's not so easy to uh, 
to summarize information in these probabilistic surveys. Okay, and so as Marco was saying, uh, the, the task is to estimate the forecast density using those probabilistic survey. And you don't observe, of course, the density forecast. What you observe is the uh, is what individuals report, which is the probability that uh, uh, the forecasted variable fall within bins, and those bins are predetermined. Okay, and so you can think of this as points in the uh, underlying cumulative distribution uh, <coughs> function for the forecast distribution. Okay, the standard approach, uh, as Marco made very clear, is to postulate a parametric form for the forecast distribution, and then to minimize the distance between uh, those observed probabilities and the CDF implied by the, the distribution, okay? And there's two limits attached to this uh, conventional approach. One is the potential uh, misspecification of the parametric form that you uh, picked up in the first place. And then uh, the, the other limit is that in, as you treat somehow uh, each respondent and date uh, separately, you cannot do any, you cannot conduct any inference, okay? You don't matter several observation for the same uh, for the same underlying parameters. Okay, so here uh, this is you know methodological contribution of uh, uh, of that paper uh, is to try to address those uh, two to overcome those two limits by using a, a Bayesian approach. Okay, so there's a you know, there's, at the most time, there's more structure and there's more flexibility. So this is, I think, what is really nice in the paper. So there's more structure because the parametric model, there's a parametric model that link, uh, uh, that makes a link between underlying forecast distribution and the observed point in the cumulative distribution function, okay? And in particular, there's a way to model why uh, forecasters bond uh, the probability they attach to certain means and also why they put zero uh, uh, probability on, on, on uh, some, some, some bits, okay? But there's also more flexibility in the sense that uh, individual density forecasts are drawn from a mixture of these parametric models, and you can think of these parametric models are representing, representing some uh, forecaster types, okay? Some are more pessimistic than others, some are, have more precise forecasts than others, and so, so forth. And so the advantage is that uh, several you're going to get several draws for the same forecast types, which will allow uh, you to conduct inference. Okay. So I think it's a very nice uh, contribution to the literature, uh, methodological contribution to the literature. And then they show you know how you can what you can do with uh, this methodology. Uh, by looking at uh, data from the USSPF and in particular GDP growth and inflation forecast for which you have a relatively long uh, sample period that you can exploit. And they focus on this measure of uncertainty, okay? uncertainty of this forecast. And they conduct tests uh, on these individual uncertainty measures. And what they find uh, as an outcome of this test is that forecasters tend to underestimate forecast uncertainty for longer horizons. At the same time, it's not the case for shorter horizons. And forecasters with higher forecast uncertainty do not have higher forecast errors. Okay. Uh, so both of these results are not completely in line with, uh, uh, with rationality, even rationality under, under imperfect information. Okay, so uh, I think, you know, the paper, as I already <laughs> Uh, said uh, is a very nice contribution to the literature. To the literature, it's a very you know, the methodological contribution is really a step forward. Uh, and uh, I don't want to you know there's probably uh, things to discuss as to whether the results are robust to uh, the choices of the priors and so on and so forth. But I don't want to go there because you know Marco knows much more <laughs> than I uh, on these dimensions. And so what I want to do in my discussion is to maybe relate uh, uh, these findings to our relate the, the methodology to other results that have been found in the literature using less sophisticated method, maybe as a way to, uh, you know, open uh, some, some direction for future research uh, using the, this new methodology. Okay, so um, it's going to be also <laughs> For me, an occasion to uh, to talk about some previous work that I had with uh, Eric Geisels and uh, Julian with you. Uh, 
uh, where we were looking, you know, at inflation risk. Okay, so using this uh, <clears throat> probabilistic survey, um, and so in this paper, uh, relatively old paper uh, now, uh, we were using the standard method that uh, uh, Marco described. So you know, we were using this uh, beta distribution. Uh, uh, assumption for the underlying uh, CDF, um, uh, underlying the, the reported uh, probabilistic survey. <clears throat> and then we were extracting individual quantiles from this estimate, from this fitted uh, beta distribution. Okay. Uh, and using this uh, estimated individual quantiles, we were computing what we, what we call inflation at risk, so which is the average of the quantile for a given probability uh, p, okay, and then uh, you, you, using this uh, this quantile, you can also compute the interquantile range, which is another measure of the dispersion or the uncertainty attached to the forecast, and the also something that is important, uh, the asymmetry uh, in the in the in the distribution of risk uh, attached to this forecast. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I think those those are pretty clear objects. And what we were finding is the following. So first of all, so this is uh, what you find for uh, uh, the, the inflation forecast in the US uh, over the sample that starts a little bit earlier than uh, what Marco was showing. So the 70s up until 2012, this is where we were uh, conducting this research. And so here you have the realization of inflation during that period and the uh, uh, inflation at risk, so the, say the top and bottom 5% quantiles estimated with, I mean, fitted, that, that comes from the fitted uh, beta distributions on the individual uh, uh, probabilistic survey, okay, respond to the probabilistic survey. And what, what you see is that it's a bit consistent with what Marco was showing that, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, dates or periods where the realizations were completely uh, outside the, the bands uh, defined by this uh, top and bottom 5% contest. Again, okay? if you look at the frequency of uh, the time the, the realizations were outside of the band, you find that it's 30%, uh, almost 30% outside of this. So, I mean, something that could be associated with a 10% band interval. Okay? So there's clearly uh, underestimation of uh, inflation uncertainty uh, from this uh, from this uh, forecast, as, as as Marco was showing. But it's as you were showing, Marco. I think this is really important. Maybe uh, we tend to overestimate the degree with which uh, forecasters were underestimating uh, uncertainty with this. Uh, uh, with this methodology where you fit uh, a beta to the individual histogram, okay? So the other results that we were having is this, uh, the evolution of the uncertainty characterized as the interquantile range, okay? So that's the blue line here. Uh, so again, that's the difference between the top and bottom 5% quantile. So you see that, again, a bit consistent with what Marco was showing, you had a period where, uh, so here you have a longer sample, so a period where uncertainty was increasing. It stayed very large for, I mean, there's fluctuation and much more actually than what uh, you get with Marco's methodology. There's fluctuations over time, but it's, you know, increased and stayed at a large, I mean, high level for a long period of time until the, uh, the, 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 the early 80, 90s, sorry. And then there's a drop here. Uh, actually quite a large drop. Uh, and we were discussing, I mean, there's several reasons why you can observe this large drop. And then an increase, uh, but much less, uh, you know, significant than before in the inflation uncertainty. Uh, so here, I think it's broadly consistent, even though there's probably much more volatility in this estimate than, than what Marco was showing. Uh, something that you don't discuss in this paper, but I'm pretty sure you could do it, uh, and it would be very interesting probably in the future work, is the asymmetry in this uh, in this uh, distribution uh, around the inflation forecast. And you see that uh, during, the eight, during the 70s, the asymmetry was positive. So the risk of having uh, high inflation was higher than the risk of having low inflation. It was negative, uh, you know, during the period of the disinflation. <laughs> 
and then become positive again, with the exception of uh, you know the period after the Great Recession. And here, that's uh, you know where people started to fear the risk of inflation in the early 2000s. Okay. Um, all right. So um, <clears throat> I want to emphasize maybe again, <laughs> underline again the, the importance of this asymmetry uh, in the, the uh, in the distribution of uh, inflation uh, inflation forecast. Um, because in, the, in that paper with Eric and, and Julien, we were showing that ex post, uh, the asymmetry <clears throat> has a positive impact on realized inflation, a positive impact beyond the average of uh, point forecast, the so-called consensus forecast. Um, that it also improves out of sample forecast compared to a random work uh, and, and also compared to the consensus forecast. So there's some information there. And that's not the case with uncertainty, actually, you know, with the interquantile range. So there's really something specific to, to, to asymmetry. And that also it, 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 tend, it tends to have an impact on the variation in the federal fund rate, uh, of course, controlling for the usual uh, output and inflation determinant implied by, by a Taylor. Okay, so there's, there's some information there in this uh, asymmetry. Issue. So I guess you know, it would be really great to have a follow up paper where you would also look at this. Uh, Asymmetry measure using a uh, new methodology. Another uh, way to relate your paper to, to the literature on survey forecast is the, the, the papers that uh, you know, document the very large disagreement uh, among professional forecasters. So here I'm showing you again, that's uh, something that I take from one of my previous papers uh, with uh, Richard Crump, Stefan Wezepi, and Emmanuel Munch. I show, uh, I show the, the, what we call the term structure of disagreement for three macro variables as observed in the blue sheep survey. Okay, so that's the, uh, so to speak, the intercontinental range across uh, forecasters for uh, various forecast horizons and three uh, forecasted variables, output growth, inflation, and the Fed fund rate. And you see that, uh, you know, uh, even for the, the Fed funds rate, one quarter of the head, you know, you have uh, something like uh, 40 basis point disagreement of what would be the Fed funds rate one quarter head uh, uh, for the, for those, uh, I mean, for those forecasters. Uh, but that's much more, you know, important for, for output. For output, you have a disagreement of, uh, you know, above 2%. Um, and for inflation is slightly uh, below two percent, and there's a disagreement remains also for very long forecast horizons. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, of course, I mean the paper is not completely related to that, but I was thinking, you know, what in the paper what would generate uh, disagreement? And uh, as Marco uh, said, but he was saying so uh, when discussing, you know, what would de generate different precisions across forecasters. There's also heterogeneity uh, in the the, the mean uh, forecast that you get at each point in time for each forecaster. So you can have, you know, because those individuals are sampled for a mixture of, middle, of models, this implies that you have heterogeneous mean projections. Okay, so you have disagreements. Uh, the model can really generate disagreements across forecasters. And then, so uh, quantitatively, I, I was thinking, you know, what what type of disagreement the, the model will generate? And so you use heterogeneous reported probability to estimate to estimate heterogeneous density forecast. But part of the heterogeneity individual reported probabilities is associated with reported uh, reporting errors and, and rounding. And so maybe uh, because of this structure, maybe the methodology will have a tendency to uh, lower disagreement compared to what you find is some other <laughs> data. And so uh, my question is, you know, how much the underlying disagreement would, would the, the, the model imply? And I think it's important for several reasons. Uh, you know, maybe, Maybe this uh, overstates the disagreement. Uh, maybe there's a lot of uh, uh, to errors or, or rounding there, uh, or, or, or maybe not so. Uh, and uh, so I think it would be interesting to to discuss that. Sorry to interrupt, Felipe. You have um, yeah. We are unfortunately running out of time. If you could um, take a minute to wrap it up, that would be great. Thank okay. You. So um, 
I think the, this will be my, my last side, the, 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 maybe the, the important question and the underlying question is what, you know, explained an, an, a related question is what explained the wedge between mean projections and, and, and the, from estimated probability solution and the reported point forecast. Um, and I don't know, you know, which one should be considered as being more uh, precise than the other. So point forecasts are, as you said, more uh, more precise uh, than than uh, uh, than mean projections. So should they, should they be considered as being more informed or rational than the probabilistic survey? At the same time, like we saw, there's uh, information in probabilistic survey that goes uh, beyond those uh, near point forecasts. And so I think. Going forward, a better understanding of the link between uh, individual density forecast and point forecast uh, would be needed in, in future research. But uh, great paper, uh, I uh, really uh, advise everyone everyone to to read it. Um, thanks so much, Felipe. Um, so it's, unfortunately we're a little bit out of time. Marco, there is a question, and I believe you can answer it online in Q and A box if you would like to do that. Uh, but we would um, probably need to move to Salim. Uh, if you'd like to upload your slides. Okay, one moment, please. Let's go to full screen. Yep, we can see that. Whoops, is that okay? Good view? Yep, we can see that. Okay, perfect. So again, thanks very much um, for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's very nice to, to give this uh, talk at the seminar series. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Robert, Siton, and Ricardo. And this paper we're actually interested in, in another proxy uh, for inflation uh, expectations rather than, than the surveys, which is uh, prices derived from uh, inflation swap markets. So what I plotted here in our uh, first slide is the break-even price of uh, inflation swaps at a one and 10 year horizon for the US and uh, the UK. Actually, we're gonna be focusing primarily on the UK market uh, for this talk, which is why I'm showing it. And yeah, in much policy circle, uh, circles, these two, well, these series have a lot of attention, as, as we all are aware. Um, they're a great high frequency gauge of what market participants uh, potentially expect inflation to be uh, going forward. And there's also a, a potential to, to fit a spot curve and derive uh, long term expectations of inflation uh, from these break even prices. However, you know, the, these are prices that are uh, uh, arising from an opaque OTC market. So it's important to ask, you know, how that market uh, functions, uh, who are the main players, and who ends up sort of bearing inflation risk in the financial system. Uh, the market is also likely to be frictional. So while we can think about the, these price series as reflecting potentially expectations of inflation and also compensation for inflation risk, they may also reflect uh, liquidity premium from, from trading constraints and other frictions. And you know, I didn't even want to get at a cleaner series and just you know, the, raw, the raw prices reflecting the fundamentals. And last, um, you know, the price that we're seeing here reflect the aggregation of, of uh, beliefs of a variety of different different agents. And so we'd like to know, you know whose who's beliefs have really been encoded in, in these prices, how much dispersion is there, and it's just a few players actually driving the swap prices that we see, okay? And so that's the sort of the questions we tackle uh, in, this, in this paper. Uh, so our starting point is that we have the uh, uni universe of transactions uh, in the inflation swap market uh, for the UK. The UK is actually quite a, a nice testing, testing ground because it has a very liquid and deep uh, inflation swap market as a result of its uh, pension fund sector having real liabilities, which is why this market is quite prominent there. I'm going to start uh, by using this data to show you a few facts. So what I want to show you is that in, in at least in the UK context, uh, the financial system, in the financial system, the banks end up being uh, net bearers of inflation risk. They sell inflation insurance uh, to the rest of the financial system. Uh, and they do so in quite a segmented way across maturities. So at the longer end of the market, you have uh, pension funds uh, buying insurance uh, from banks. 
Whereas uh, at shorter maturities, you see basically hedge funds speculating, they buy and sell uh, inflation swaps. Um, uh, to my understanding, whether inflation is essentially rising or falling, they speculate uh, to a greater extent. And so you have this segmentation, and different participants um, being present at different segments of the market. And what we're interested in basically using that segmentation to ask uh, which shocks are actually uh, driving the prices and quantities that we can see in uh, our data. And so what we do uh, in the paper is you write down a simple portfolio choice problem uh, for these different agents that we, we observe in the data with some segmentation. Uh, I'll probably explain most of the intuition behind that model using some curve shifting uh, today, as opposed to go through it in, in full detail, just to save time, save time excuse me. Um, but we use the model really to propose three different identification strategies, one based on uh, the high frequency of data we observe, one based on the cross section, and one based on the time series to try and sort of decompose the price changes that we see into a fundamental ready to expect inflation and or, or, or compensation to, for inflation risk and a liquidity premium, which you can think of sort of picking up uh, uh, trading frictions, okay? So we, we then take these, these inflation strategies and we fit them into a, a structure of AR, we a time series model, and we do three things. So the first from sort of more finance perspective is just ask, you know, how does the market function? Uh, what are the slopes of supply and demand in these different segments uh, that we see? And that's going to allow us to answer you know, question, the question, what shocks are really driving uh, the inflation swap market process and maturities? And that leads to a more macro question, which is, given there could be a variety of different forces driving the price that we see, how reliable are uh, the swap prices um, as a measure of expected inflation and, and you know, as a measure of fundamentals, given the potential presence of liquidity premium. And what I'm going to show you really is that the, the longer term inflation swap uh, ends up being more reliable than uh, the shorter term uh, series. And lastly, you know, given we observe the trading behavior of individual agents, we're going to ask you know, how much dispersion amongst the sort of beliefs about inflation uh, is there among those agents from their trading behavior? Whose beliefs really matter in terms of, of driving uh, swap prices? And you know, where we end up here is that actually, it's in, especially in the short-term segment of the market, it's just a, a handful of, of funds that are really driving the prices that we're seeing. It's not, it's not a sort of very deep um, cross-section of the funds that are explaining the, the average um, level of expected inflation. That's less true in longer term stock markets again. So they're, they're much more a belief across many different funds. And also we have a quite nice result at the end that, that trading behavior that we see also maps into uh, expectations of inflation from individual institutions in particular banks. So there's a mapping between surveys and, uh, and trading behavior. So we can, we can see that in our data too. Okay, so that, that's the overview. Let me dump, jump directly into the, the the first part, which is the facts about uh, how this uh, market uh, functions. So um, what I'm plotting here is um, the net sales of uh, inflation swaps in blue by uh, banks against the natural hedge, which is index linked uh, government bond uh, holdings. Okay, these two, th these two, uh, uh, assets have similar maturities on bank balance sheets. You sort of just you can just basically compare the two, the two time series. Okay, and so what you're seeing here, if you just look at the the figure, say for 2021 Q1, there's a hundred billion dollar gap between the the blue and gold line. And what this means is that you know since that this point in time, the UK uh, price index is overshot by around 15 percent. Okay, so this hundred billion dollar gap means that in cash flow terms banks have lost around $15 billion on their inflation positions or around 3% uh, of their capital. Okay, so it's you know, a relatively chunky loss coming from their direct uh, inflation exposures. Obviously, they have other hedges uh, against uh, rising rates and rising inflation, but just from this specific market, 
uh, banks are taking losses from, from uh, higher inflation. So who's winning? Well, on the other side of, of uh, the bank's uh, positions are our pension funds. So the main buyers of inflation protection uh, is the pension fund sector. And what you're seeing here is that you know, the, the 100 billion position by, by banks is effectively taken up most entirely uh, by pension funds. Now I've switched the sign of the series. So this is net, net purchases of protection rather than net sales. Okay. And the key striking fact here is a sort of maturity structure. So pension funds are really buying uh, protection at very long maturities and not very much in terms of um, shorter term swaps. But actually, both parts of the market, so short short term swaps and, and, and longer term swaps, are actively traded. So at the at the at the short end, what we see instead is is a different market participant, which is which is hedge funds. Okay, so they end up being um, basically net buyers and net sellers at different points in time of uh, short dated inflation swaps. Okay, and so when inflation was very low during the pandemic, they were selling protection and benefiting from falling inflation. As inflation started to rise, they switched their position and um, started buying, so they were winning from uh, rising uh, inflation, okay? And um, the message from this is that they're primarily doing that using very, very uh, short dated inflation swaps, so sort of three years or less. And just to illustrate the segmentation um, more clearly, this is, this is trading volumes. Uh, day trading volumes for, for uh, swaps less than 10 years and swaps uh, less than three years. And you can see a lot of blue on, on the left-hand side and a lot of yellow on the right-hand side. So you can see the pension funds are primarily trading long and, and hedge funds are primarily trading short. But the sort of total volumes are very similar across these, these two uh, market uh, segments. Okay, so where I want to go next with this is just to ask the question again. We're seeing these quantities. We have um, uh, the price series for these, for these different swaps. Can we use the segmentation to try and tease out what are the shocks that are driving the prices and quantity series that we see? And just to explain our ideas using some, some simple plots, as I said, and I'll formalize things in a couple of slides afterwards. So, um, Let's start with, with, a, with a simple, you know, um, supply and demand um, uh, picture. So, you know, you can imagine pension funds having some, some demand curve uh, for inflation protection. To the extent that they have uh, some risk aversion, that would be uh, downward slopey in their portfolio uh, choice um, problem, okay? Now, because this is an OTC market, uh, swaps are in zero net supply and it's dealer intermediated. So the supply of inflation swaps comes from banks, okay? And that's the inverse of the bank's demand curve for inflation protection. So why, why would we see a situation where banks end up uh, supplying uh, inflation protection? Uh, well, that could be just disagreement about expected inflation. Banks may expect inflation to be uh, lower than, than pension funds. It could be uh, a difference in, in their risk aversion or uh, hedging of other assets. There are a variety of reasons why we could see this sort of outcome. Either way, you know, if, if, if there's a shock to expectations about future inflation, both these demand supply curves will shift and we'll end up with a new equilibrium. Okay? But there could be other non-fundamental reasons why uh, banks are not supplying insurance. So, for example, pension fund mandates generate um, background risk, they need to hedge, hedge their real liabilities, and they have trading constraints as well, that means they can't fully hedge things. And as those mandates change, the background risk they face change, as those trading constraints change, uh, that will shift around pension fund uh, demand for uh, inflation protection, that acts as demand shock. And similarly, banks have their own uh, trading constraints as well, uh, and op operational reasons why they need to be long or short inflation. And as, as those constraints shift around, that will act as a constraint on uh, supply. And of course, we also have a segmented market. So we have a long market where uh, pension funds uh, face banks and a short market where 
uh, hedge funds, uh, various banks instead. Okay, in the short market, you have a, basically a, a zero position in the long market. Um, pension funds at the moment need protection. Of course, a supply shock to the banks is going to shift uh, prices in both markets, whereas there might also be a hedge fund uh, demand shock as well, which is moving things around in the short market. Okay, so that's sort of the idea behind how our model works. We sort of formalize that uh, in, a, in a sort of very straightforward car or normal portfolio choice problem. So you can think about a mass of, of, of pension funds indexed by I and F indexed pension funds. They have some uh, initial wealth, AFI, a risk aversion parameter, gamma FI, uh, and they can buy a long-term inflation swap and another asset. They have some beliefs about inflation, so pi FI, is equal to mu fi times the average belief uh, across all market participants. And they face some, some background risk and some generic trading constraints. When you sort of plug that into your, your standard car, car and wall framework um, and you allow for risk aversion to scale with wealth, you get this sort of demand curve where the, the desired demand for inflation protection scaled by wealth is just a downward sloping function of the price and on risk aversion a fundamental, so this is expectations of inflation and desired compensation for uh, inflation risk. And then a, a term here, which reflects these last two uh, objects, background risk and then sort of generic trading constraints on the ability to hold uh, inflation protection. What we do then is have a short-term market where we, we add hedge funds who have the same problem. And you know both hedge funds and, and uh, Pension funds are facing banks who are active in, in both markets, and they're basically the supply curve um, uh, that, that uh, these two institutions are facing, okay? So when you put this all together, you get uh, a demand curve here from pension funds in, in the long market, uh, a supply curve from banks in, in the long market too, with equivalently demand and supply shocks essentially, and, and then two fundamentals. And, you know, if I use capitals to denote prices and quantities uh, in the uh, short market, this is the quantity demanded by hedge funds, the quantity supplied by banks, and then, you know, two shocks, a supply shock and a demand shock, and then uh, a fundamental as well. Okay, and so you can think about there being a frictionless price, which captures what the price would be absent in every other shocks, which arise from trading constraints, or say background risk and some liquidity premium, uh, which arises from uh, the actual shocks, okay? So what I described to you essentially is a system where we see two different prices, a long-dated price and uh, the short-dated price, two different quantities, the quantity demanded in, 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 uh, in both markets. Um, and we have four shocks, right? We have a fundamental shock, a shock to hedge fund demand, a shock to pension fund demand, and a supply shock. Uh, uh, to banks, okay? And so our goal really is to say, okay, we have these, these four different time series. Uh, how do we get at the, um, uh, the shocks that are driving the time series that we see? And in estimation terms, you're gonna add dynamics of a simple VAR. So this is a classic time series identification problem uh, and there are various tools to solve this. Um, so the first thing we do uh, is a simple heteroscity approach. So uh, we think that, you know, we know that on certain days, uh, particularly when inflation is, is uh, released, but you can also, uh, that's like inflation data is released, uh, but you can also look at margin policy analysis as well as an alternative. Uh, there's a lot more information about inflation and its future path. Okay, so we say, look, those on those dates, uh, the relative variance of the fundamental uh, shock went up, we can use that as, as an identification strategy, and, and that's clearly there in the data. We just look at the, the shift in relative variances um, on news and inflation announcements. You, you, um, you uh, see the shift in relative variances of the shocks. And you know, to the extent you have a shift in variances, uh, you can use that to identify um, the uh, impact matrix in the VAR. The second thing we do, which is, is slightly more novel, is exploit the um, uh, Gabe and Kojin, um results on granularity. And that's to say that you know, when we have relatively large institutions in uh, our data, idiosyncratic shocks don't necessarily uh, 
their towels. Okay, and it is the case that you know, in the inflation swap market, you have some very large players and some relatively small players, and the shocks of those those uh, large players are not able to sort of go to zero uh, in expectation once you weight them across um, all uh, institutions. Okay, so what we do here is essentially fit a factor model so that the demand curves we have have a factor structure. Okay, they have a structure where we say uh, uh, individual institutions demand is a function fundamental, expects inflation and conversation for inflation risk and a liquidity premium. We can get these idiosyncratic uh, shock to demand from individual institutions um, uh, uh, trading behavior. And then say, look, if we take the size weighted average of that, that should be a valid instrument uh, for the demand shock. Um, particularly if essentially that there's granularity in, in the data. We can do it for pension funds, we can do it for hedge funds, we can do it for, for, for banks and, and construct instruments. And then, then obviously the fourth shock emerges as a residual, which is the fundamental shock. Um, now, you know, just to be clear, there is there is clear evidence of, of uh, granularity in this data. As I mentioned, there's a very large institutions and some, and some very small ones. So, you know, the Prater parameter is 0.13 and the power law coefficient is around minus 0.9, okay? Uh, the last thing we do, this is our third strategy, is basically rely on um, the high frequency of the data to propose for assigning restrictions. So you make two further assumptions. First is that essentially hedge funds react faster than banks who react faster uh, than the pension funds to fundamental news about uh, expected inflation. So basically the news are higher for hedge funds than they are for banks and they are for, for, for pension funds. And that means that when there's a when there's news about inflation as a fundamental shock, hedge fund demand rises more than, than bank supply falls. Okay, so a fundamental shock looks like a demand shock in the short-term market, but the opposite is true in uh, the long market. Okay. The second assumption we make is something we call um, death separation. And that means that you know, imagine that there's a bank who, who operates in this market. Uh, they'll have a desk that, you know, focuses on their pension fund clients and provides them with long-term inflation expectation depending on their trading needs, and a desk that fo focuses on their hedge fund clients and um, provides them short-term inflation protection depending on their trading needs. Those two desks are, during the day, sort of separate. Uh, they have some trading limits, they have some capital allocated to them, at the end of the day, the bank meets and sort of reallocates capital to these two funds, but it means that, so it's these two desks, it means that during the day, a shock to demand in the given market is not met by uh, a shock to supply, okay? And that leaves a set of time restrictions where uh, a demand shock in, um, uh, in the short market uh, it raises uh, prices and quantities in that market, but does nothing in the long market, the opposite is true uh, for for uh, long market. A supply a supply shock is a plus minus plus minus in both markets, and this fundamental shock has this plus plus minus plus uh, pattern. Okay, so those are the three strategies that we we show. Uh, and what's really nice about this is you know, we can we can take any of these two strategies. They they really rely on different sources of variation in the data. Uh, so uh, as I said, you know, the the, the the um, sign restrictions rely on something about timing and a high frequency data set. The granularity uses the cross section of trading behavior, and the um, the approach relies on basically a long time series of many inflation releases for it to work. But no matter which approach we take, we actually identify very very similar to the shocks. This is showing the correlations of the estimated fundamental shock from the free strategy. So sign restrictions the granular V and electricity, and you can see that all three of them um, generate a, a similar uh, correlation uh, matrix. And moreover, you know, all three strategies are different moment conditions. And so the IRS from, from say the, the electricity or the, or the granular differential variables confirm the sign restrictions from strategy three. Uh, you can actually check these two assumptions hold in the micro data. Um, the fundamental shock identified by strategies one and three uh, actually confirms the exclusion restriction required for the ground internet variables. And if you look at uh, the fundamental shock 
that emerges from strategy two and three, it does have higher variance um, uh, on the basis of strategy one, apologies for the typo. So you actually see the heterocysticity um, uh, result coming through. And for now, I'm just going to focus on results from time from the time restriction as well, just to save time um, uh, compared to just going through all different strategies at once. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to show you is, is our results about the structure of the financial market. So since we've identified you know, demand shocks and supply shocks in both different uh, segments of the market, we can actually estimate the slope of the supply and demand curves, uh, on impact at least. And what I'm plotting you here is, is the slope um, and the median estimate for these two segments. And what you're seeing here basically is the slope of the demand curves is very, very similar across uh, hedge funds and pension funds. For inflation protection, hedge funds are sort of slightly more elastic, which I think aligns with um, my prize, but you know, it's not obviously um, the case in terms of fiscal significance. Now, what's different is if you look at the supply curve. So what you're seeing here is that in the short market, dealers have a, have a, have a much steeper supply curve uh, compared to the long market. So in fact, the supply slope is around 0.01. It's very, very flat in the, um, the long term. Uh, inflation swap market. Okay, and it has an in interesting economic uh, implication. It means that essentially demand shocks from uh, pension funds have very limited implication for implications for uh, inflation uh, swap prices at the longer end of the market. Whereas at the short end of the market, as you can see, a demand shock from a hedge fund is going to have a bigger impact. On, on prices, okay? So if you look at the variance decomposition of prices, so that's, that's what you're seeing here, the fundamental shock has a greater share of the forecast error variance decomposition in the longer inflation swap market than the shorter inflation swap market. And the reason being is that more of the variance is driven by uh, demand shocks in the short market when compared to the uh, long market, okay? And that's all coming from this much flatter supply curve, okay? And the implication of this is that long-term inflation swap prices actually do have sort of more fundamentals contained within them than the short data price, okay? So that means that you, if you're looking for a more reliable series, uh, the longer one, the longer term uh, swap price perhaps is the one to focus upon. And just to illustrate, just illustrate that, this is a simple uh, historical decomposition showing you um, the actual uh, longer dated inflation swap price, the break even, versus a counterfactual where we remove all supply and demand shocks and just let the fundamental uh, explain uh, movements in prices. Now, what we actually took away from this is that there's a sort of pattern of, of overshooting. So when inflation fell uh, during um, the pandemic, the uh, sort of counterfactual series, just fundamental shocks, remained above um, actual uh, swap prices in terms of long dated swap. And when inflation rose uh, during 2021 and during also um, sort of this mini financial crisis we had uh, in the UK in the autumn of 2022, the uh, counterfactual swap price remained below the uh, actual uh, swap price. And just to illustrate that point um, uh, more clearly, I'm zooming into two different specific large shocks uh, to expect inflation that we had over our sample period. So what you're seeing here is that you know, when, when, when the pandemic, pandemic uh, struck, struck, excuse me, um, there was a, a large fall in expected inflation, as, as you would expect, but there was also a fall in the sort of liquidity premium, the gap between the blue and the red line here. And that drove this um, situation where this gap widened uh, and the blue line remained above the red line. If you look at an alternative positive shock to inflation, which was the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and that caused a, a very sharp increase in energy prices, uh, in, in the UK and, and the rise in, in expected inflation, then we do see this, this sort of fundamental shock kicking in and raising expected inflation, but also the, the, 
the liquidity premium, the gap between this actual and counterfactual on the previous slide also went up and led to some overshooting uh, as well. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the short-term inflation spot price seems to be um, uh, less reliable. As indicator, this is a short making that point. There's much more variation or much larger gap, sorry, between the red and the blue line um, when it comes to looking at uh, shorter term inflation spot price. The final point I want to make is just that, you know, we obviously are estimating something we, we call a liquidity premium uh, here, which is this gap between our fundamental price and, and the actual price, essentially. And another way of proxying liquidity is just to ask, um, uh, what's the, uh, the bid ask spread in, in the inflation spot market? And this is showing you the, the autumn uh, crisis in the UK. We have a very nice correlation between our estimated supply shock uh, from dealers and uh, the, um, the one year uh, bid ask spread um, that we see, the one year swap bid ask spread that we see in the, in the sort of uh, raw data. So there is something here regarding the correlation between our measures and simple market proxies uh, for liquidity. Okay, so in my last, I guess I have, what, seven, eight minutes to go. Uh, I'll just discuss very briefly individual uh, trading uh, behavior and how that maps into expectations, okay? So what I'm showing you here is the trading response of individual institutions uh, in response to the fundamental shock uh, that we identify using um, uh, sign restrictions, okay? So we'd expect that banks have a negative coefficient uh, here, that's our, our uh, des sorry, that's our uh, differential reactiveness assumption kicking in, okay? So when the fundamental shock hits, um, banks should um, end up um, being uh, basically more protection and hedge funds have a positive coefficient and applying more protection, okay? That's a differential reactive assumption kicking in. And we're seeing that here in terms of this negative and positive coefficient. Uh, if I just rank the institutions in our, in our sample regarding their reactiveness, what do we see? Well, we see that basically you know, there's essentially six hedge funds that explain most of the positive reaction and a couple more um, that actually react in the opposite direction. There's some disagreement about how they, they react to the fundamental shock. And again, there's around uh, five or six dealer banks doing the same thing. I should say this, this is this is um, price impact in the short term uh, market. So the message from this really is that there's only a handful of institutions that are really driving the reaction to, a, to the fundamental shock in, in the short term market and explaining the responses that we're, we're seeing. Uh, if you look across the different identification strategies as well, rather than just sign restrictions, you see a very, very similar uh, picture as well. Okay, whoops, excuse me. The last thing we do in the paper is try and uh, reconcile um, market um, behavior and sort of trading volumes versus the surveys of individual institutions, okay? So what we do is again, zoom in on, on the, um, the short-term market and uh, look at the behavior of individual banks Okay, so we can say, look, we we observe the trading behavior of some institution um, I among, among the banks uh, in response to the fundamental shock that we that we estimate. Okay, and we would expect this this beta to be to be negative. Okay, and they be hedged by by banks across banks. Okay, at the same time, we can also look at um, from Bloomberg the survey expectation of the bank about, about inflation. Okay, we can ask, how does your inflation forecast uh, change from one month to the next based on uh, the cumulative fundamental shock that we estimate between those, uh, those two months? Okay, so this is the two questions that we're asking. In, in our model, both of these two parameters are proxies for how sensitive um, uh, the, mark, the individual agent's expectations are to the average uh, component. In the case it gets you some measure of, of disagreement, and these two coefficients should be almost perfectly uh, correlated okay, from our, from our uh, modeling framework. So if I just run these two regressions, 
and compare the uh, coefficients. So I'm now using different amplification strategies depending on whether I want to use time restrictions, grand instrumental variables, or statisticity to define a fundamental shock. What you see is that you know there's a very strong upward sloping uh, relationship between the coefficients uh, estimated from um, the survey of uh, inflation at the individual institution level and their actual trading behavior. This is a monthly regression, it's the daily regression as well, I should, I should, I should add. So there is a pattern here whereby surveys actually do map into, um, into uh, trading uh, behavior. Okay, so I'll just wrap up here. I'm probably actually a little bit ahead of time, which is always good. Uh, so what do we do in this paper? So the first thing is we um, present some facts. So at the short horizon, we show you that um, hedge funds and dealers alternate between uh, negative and positive net positions in the inflation swap market, whereas at longer horizons, the segmentation, dealers provide or banks provide inflation protection to pension funds. Then we, provide, then we propose three step foot strategies uh, that exploit various pieces of our data to try and separate out um, the times, the, the price causes that we see in something fundamental and, and, and uh, liquidity premium. That allows us to get a supply and demand curves into the market segments. At the short horizon, the supply curve is, is relatively steep. And so demand shocks end up driving prices. But we have this quite flat uh, slope at uh, long, the longer horizon. And that means that fundamental shocks matter, matter uh, much more, actually account for a much bigger share of price variation. That allows us to sort of get a, a cleaner measure of expected inflation, uh, cleaner these liquidity free frictions from uh, the inflation uh, swap market. And that measure is actually, if you look at longer data in swaps, especially it's more anchored, right? But when there's, when inflation uh, falls, uh, it falls less in the um, clean measure versus the, um, uh, the raw price series. Okay, and we also showed that um, uh, the uh, trading behavior that we see uh, actually match with uh, expected, expectations of inflation inferred from uh, survey answers. Okay, so that's all for me. I look forward very much to the discussion and um, thanks for having me. Um, thanks, so, thanks so much, Salim. Uh, you are um, perfectly on time. In fact, we have a couple of minutes and um, uh, there are no questions from the audience, um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and ask mine. Um, so the last point in your conclusions, does it mean that we can take it as a proof for rationality of this forecast? Is, is it kind of the right way of thinking about it? No, really. no that's, not what, that's not what we're saying. Uh, I think we're saying, I mean, we haven't separated out uh, expectations from, from risk premium to start with. We haven't done any tests on rationality here. We're trying to get a cleaner measure of uh, fundamentals driving uh, the inflation swap market when compared to, say, you know, the liquidity premium that could be present and actually driving market prices from, say, a raw term, Bloomberg term, or something like this. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, um, Eric, would you like your, to put up your slide? Yeah. Thank you. You should be able to see my slides. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. I don't know how Salim uh, ended up early. Uh, I actually kind of struggle to go uh, through the paper in its entirety. There's really uh, lots of work down there. Um, I'll spend lots of time uh, on what I, I view it as in my summary, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, identification. I think uh, I, I kind of. It's very, it's very convincing, but I think there are like things that we can learn uh, from what they are doing. And then I'll also word about, you know, once we have, as Salim said, this clean measure of uh, expectations from swap prices, uh, what, what kind of outcomes can we look at? What do they look at? And, and what can we do with this? Um, so, you know, we really want to understand sort of like this market for inflation risk that's a relatively new market, the swap market that's different from the, uh, uh, what would be like tips. Uh, and if we want to understand it, you know, it's not only like we look at the data and we get some clean measure of expected uh, inflation, we really need to understand who are the market participants, 
what really is driving prices, meaning you know what shocks are market participants affected uh, by that will drive prices, and then how do these prices themselves respond to shocks? So it's not necessarily one to one. We need to sort of like filter uh, uh, this out. You know, like how do they respond to both uh, fundamentals of inflation, but also sort of like shocks to market structure? It can be like you know liquidity or even like hedging demands of some of the uh, participants. And you know the big question. Uh, once we have done that, it's like, well, can we assess whether this market is actually a real reliable measure of inflation? Right? I think lots of people rely on this, uh, well, for hedging, but also for uh, uh, conducting policy to see, you know, what's ahead, like how uh, do inflation expectations respond when I make, let's say, announcements, like uh, how do they respond? And here we can actually try to use the market structure with this uh, very sort of like detailed transaction level data uh, on the UK inflation swap market to back out, to so isolate these fundamental shocks. And I think, uh, I, I don't know if it's a surprise, I, you know, this paper was full of surprise to me, like given my ignorance uh, on, the, on, on the subject, but I think what's Probably a surprise is that you know the fundamental is actually strong, but mostly on long-term expectations. So, like the one thing you'll be able to recover is probably like long-term expectations, not so much on the uh, uh, short end. Though it might, and uh, also worry about uh, this. Okay, so I saw that paper as kind of like the next generation of using finance, uh, high-frequency finance data to uh, bring some. Uh, identification for monetary economics. I think you know. I think most people are familiar to uh, identifying monetary policy shocks, like you know, uh, papers like Kuttner and like Nakamura Steinson using uh, Fed futures. This paper, I feel, is kind of like like the next generation of data uh, where we go beyond monetary policy shocks. I think more and more models. There's been a push to think more about you know not only heterogeneous agents, but also measuring very directly expectations and here being able to identify these expectations at very high frequency uh, using the structure just feels very like the natural following of what we have seen uh, uh, before. So it's it's both useful for academics and, and policy in the sense that we have these clean measures uh, but also clean responses of uh, these expectations to shock. So if you're, again, like if you're someone who is interested in like how to conduct monetary policy and you're really worried about anchoring, for example, you can see exactly whether, you know, inflation expectations do respond, how much they respond. And then, you know, if the shocks that you see on the markets, well, are they shocks to your um, speech on it, so like liquidity shocks that will eventually uh, die off. So that's, I think, very important and how we uh, view our models and how we bring our models to the data. But I said, of course, you know, like I don't need to give motivation to this, uh, to the authors, but I, you know, I think this is usually important and, and we usually, we kind of like have ways of measuring efficient expectations, but, you know, this makes a very convincing case that uh, this is a high frequency and also like the, the nature of, of the data that we have high frequency measures that um, inflation expectations makes me think that it's going to be very useful to think about shocks and, and, and the responses. So, so when we think about, again, as I said, like forward guidance of anchoring or even, you know, putting this in the uh, standard three equation model, it's going to be very, very useful in bringing a bunch of things to the, to the data. Now, I see uh, the problem that solves as two sides of a problem. I was reading actually last week, there was an uh, article in the New York Times about uh, some conference about prediction markets, uh, where you can see sort of like, so, sort of like idiosyncratic people in uh, Silicon Valley trying to make bets and trying to uh, get off the ground uh, uh, prediction markets. And I don't know if you can see on the right hand side, but basically they are like trying to run wonder if Taylor Swift next door will sell more tickets uh, than the first one. And, you know, it seems a little bit like out there and not, not very interesting, but some of these people think they're solving the the, uh, uh, the world, but, you know, their problems are very simple, right? Uh, well, talking about idiosyncratic bets on smaller markets in that sense, at least the people who favor them think these markets are super clean and then they're gonna solve all the problems of, of the world by, you know, uh, uh, basically letting the good ideas uh, make money and the bad ideas uh, lose money. So in that sense, you know, uh, since 
because they are like on small amounts and and you know they're the people betting on them are really just interested in the betting for the betting there's less likely to be affected by liquidity or hedging motives but they're also less likely to be interesting and and the stakes are just too low for us to rely on them on the other side actually so uh, uh the the problem of this paper is like kind of solving the io problem of like you know the ready to eat cereal industry some kind of like you know one of the big blp uh, a model and you know how do we interpret movement in prices is going to depend a lot on the market structure so that's the total opposite of like you know these simplistic prediction markets like well we have a market everything's moving at the same time what do i do right and that's something that i economists try to solve right you know if prices go up it could be because people like cereal better when they wake up in the morning one day uh but also because grain prices go up because you know um i don't know in some part of the globe there is a war or maybe all prices are up, but fertilizer is not so plentiful. Uh, and the changes that you're gonna observe both in quantities and prices are gonna depend on both the structure of demand and the structure of supply. And then, you know, we have ways to deal with this, uh, but they are not easy. And, and I kind of feel like this paper is bringing the latter kind of, I wouldn't say machinery, but it's not like the latter approach of being very like, uh, um, thoughtful about how to think about the structure of the market to actually get something uh, important uh, from, from this market for, for inflation, right? So they are carefully thinking about participants on preferences, hedging motive, liquidity, etc. And and so, you know, makes this market closer to basically the ready-to-eat cereal industry than these uh, small pure predictions markets. And, and the question is really, how do we solve fundamentals from other trading models? And that's what I want to talk about talk about next my uh, identification so i think at the heart of the identification is this uh figure from the from the paper that Salim already showed that's very striking in uh in in dark blue you have the uh, basically push pension funds uh trading volume and uh yellow hedge funds and on the left you have uh, short-term uh swaps and on the right you have long-term uh no sorry that's on the left you have uh, long-term swaps and on the right you have short-term swaps and you know what's striking and i think the choice of curve here is very wise you can see that you know hedge funds totally dominate the short term and then uh pension funds the 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 long term and you know we'd like to think as short uh hedge funds are being some form of arbitrageurs or liquidity traders and pension funds being sort of like motivated by uh, uh, actually strong hedging motives where they actually care what inflation expectation is, right? So it's already sort of like a preview that basically there might, there will be probably more uh, hard fundamental information on the long end than uh, on the short end. But it's not so easy uh, uh, to make inference, right? If you have perfectly segmented market and you think about only one uh, market with two agents, you have three shocks to estimate, right? You have the two demand shocks for each agent, and then you have fundamental shock. That's really what you're after here. But you only have two observables, so you're kind of like uh, left out to dry here. If you're thinking about two markets and three agents, now you have four shocks uh, and four observables. Why four shocks? Well, you have the the nice thing here is that you have uh, two shocks for pension funds and hedge funds, and then you have another shock for the dealers which are basically the, the counterpart, but the dealers are kind of the same on both markets. So that means that you have two markets now, so four observable price and quantities on both markets, but you only have three demand shocks or you know, demand supply shocks kind of uh, for the three agents. And then you have the fundamental shock. So presumably you could be able to solve this. I mean, you still need an instrument, but at least you know it's not uh, totally indeterminate. And I think that's, that's kind of like the key here. I like to think about the, uh, uh, how they approach this using sign restriction. So, so basically here you can see that's the, the matrix that transmits the shocks to the outcome. So uh, uh, Q and P quantities and prices of short term and long term uh, market. And, and what you can see here is that the hedge funds here are only contributed to the short end. That's kind of an assumption. The uh, pension funds only to the long end. The dealer is going to behave the, the same way on the short and the long end. But what's crucial here is that you have some heterogeneity in how the long-term and the short-term respond to uh, uh, fundamental news. And that has to do with the fact that basically uh, uh, hedge funds are gonna front run banks kind of information and banks are gonna front run themselves, are gonna themselves front run uh, uh, pension funds. 
Okay, so I have actually like something I was a little bit confused about, and I had some issues with sign restrictions to think about the magnitude, right? So sign restrictions are going to put some restrictions how you actually going to run your identifications, but you know you can consider unit demand and price on both market, right? So just take the simplest uh, outcome. How can I back out uh, uh, the uh, shocks? And here think about the two following transmission mat matrices. So the first one, I just replaced the plus and the minuses by ones and minus ones. And the second one just did a, a tiny sh change where pension funds are actually, uh, sorry, yeah, the shock to pension fund is actually going to have a slightly smaller impact on prices than in the other case, right? And then, you know, you just take the inverse of that matrix and then run it through your uh, uh, observable. And, and here's what you find for your shock, you invert the system. And I was actually kind of surprised. Maybe I, I made a mistake on here, but the point is not is, is both that here, the first shock, you actually recover only non-fundamental shocks. Uh, but if you go through the second one, you actually recover non-fundamental shocks and some partially fundamental shocks. My point is actually not so much that sometimes you have uh, non-fundamental shock, uh, depending on so like the magnitudes of the coefficient, uh, uh, while still respecting the sign restrictions, it's that you know, it's going. I mean, there are ways to deal with this, but it it is it does kind of like shut down a little bit a little bit of the the magnitudes. And I'm not quite sure how, how how to to think about this and how to deal with. This. I have to say that the identification of all are very convincing in the sense that they use kind of triangulation method by using three identification schemes and making sure they all match. So, you know, like this is really a criticism of this in uh, 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 if it was by itself. The fact that they do it three times and sort of like kind of match should put this uh, to rest, but I'm still kind of curious of what, what's going on and how, how this actually uh, ends up working. Okay, so so the evidence for the ex-ante sign restrictions are also kind of like, I'd like to know a bit more, like there is assumptions of no leakages between uh, the desk separation between the, the dealer while trading in both markets and the fact that hedge funds trade, trade mostly on the short end, but you know, there's kind of an endogeneity argument here that, you know, if the spread between the short and the long end gets too wide, is there really no one that's going to step in there? Like the hedge funds don't trade at the long end, but maybe there are reasons they don't. Maybe they don't have to because the pension funds are doing it for them. So, and then the other thing is that, you know, hedge funds seem to front run banks of information, but, you know, I, I read in, in the paper that banks have access to the centrally cleared market for these swaps. And so they're going to observe flows from, very diverse part of the market, and they should have actually a bunch more information than hedge funds. So I wasn't so uh, uh, clear about clear about this, and it's not obvious how we actually will show that hedge funds do front run banks uh, uh, here. The second method I think was uh, uh, interesting, really kind of like what I like to call controlling for things. We're gonna extract uh, shocks on market participants by basically flexibly controlling uh, their uh, for, for for their demand. And then, you know, once we back out uh, three shocks for each of the market participants, that's kind of enough to identify the uh, systems of four uh, simultaneous equation. Now, here, actually, the others kind of stop short of what I thought was interesting. Like, they do the inference using interactive fixed effects, but they don't actually tell us what are the factors. There is some theoretical motivation to what these factors are, but... We never go back to, oh, do these factors actually match the interpretation of the model into sort of like a part that's liquidity, a part that's fundamental? Like, how are the loadings? And we could actually know what the loadings on these are, like almost on a uh, investor level basis. So that would be sort of like need to link heterogeneity in loadings and, you know, characteristics of, of these, these investors. Then I have my usual like gripe with GIV that, you know, it's sort of like catch 22 if the shots are large such that it's relevant it's also kind of hard to uh, to claim that it's like purely uh exogenous right so you know how can we exclude these shocks from other participants response but you know that's probably for uh xavier gavex to answer uh all right so now outcomes uh in the few minutes i've left what to do with the shocks okay so the the obvious thing is like okay produce a clean estimate of inflation expectation fine the second thing that uh, I think Salim showed, and I, I didn't see so much uh, uh, in the paper, but uh, Salim showed some, some slides to that effect. So estimate the response of market participants to non-fundamental shocks and, you know, relate to the usual suspects of like capacity constraint, financing constraints of these 
uh, things. And then for future work though, I think there is some uh, of that in the paper, like think about monetary policy, how do these respond to monetary policy shocks that can be measured at high frequency and then the short and long run response to these and, and maybe something about the effectiveness of forward guidance. Uh, uh, skip this in the interest of time. So the forecasting that what what Salim showed is like the how their merger in blue actually match uh, inflation expectation. Though so I think what would be really interesting is to and then obviously there's not enough data, but to show this on the whole, if I may say so, like the whole yield curve of inflation expectations, right? What you'd like to see is like is the ten year tracking the ten year? Is the ten year swap market tracking the one year? Like what? What, what is it actually measuring and, and uh, uh, is it measuring the right thing? Or even if it's not measuring the right thing, that's that's still interesting. And I kind of like to know how, how it's used and how the whole like, curve uh, is going to uh, uh, respond here. And the last thing I'd say, what's interesting when we look at the response to uh, non-fundamental shocks is really uh, the response to a shock, uh, uh, not only on the dealer uh, uh, side, which seems to match what, what they have argued, but also on what happens on uh, other th side of the market, right? So for example, you know, the response to value shocks is going to highlight some frictions by thinking about like who should be arbitraging the curve and, and why do they do it or why don't, don't they do it? So here, uh, if you think about the shock, uh, demand shock on pension funds, Actually, you know, we have seen that pension funds mostly uh, uh, move on the long-term market. So not surprisingly, long-term market, swap market move on impact in quantity and prices. But there is a permanent effect on uh, uh, the swap market on the short end that I, I think is actually uh, quite interesting. And I, I'm not sure, like, is there some people arbitraging the curve here and then that, that move that uh, back? Anyways, I think it's time for me to uh, wrap up. So... The takeaway is really that you know, like liquidity money is more is the information that's embedded in the sh this short shortened inflation swap such that the clean measure can be kind of only obtained uh, uh, in, in long-term swaps. But, you know, that's kind of a victory. We have sort of a clean measure from uh, financial markets of, of inflation expectations. And, you know, for me, it can give me some comfort that you know, market structure of prediction market do matter. And we can really just take them at face value. We need to understand what the market does. That's a very neat application of demand estimation for a very useful question and, and striking results of market segmentation. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Eric. Um, Salim, I, I think we actually do have a couple of minutes this time. So if you'd like to respond, just uh, take a couple of minutes. Uh, sure, absolutely. So so thanks very much for a very uh, thoughtful discussion, Eric. That was really, really nice to hear. I, I enjoyed your, your points. I mean, on the identification, uh, I think our take is that you can criticize any of the uh, three approaches we, we take. Uh, there are issues with all three of them, uh, including the ones you raised with the, the time restrictions in terms of, you know, you have to make these assumptions which are quite, which are quite stark. And, and um, you know, there isn't fantastic evidence in the paper for them. Uh, there's also issues with, with, with granularity, as you mentioned. Uh, as well. And so our take is that you know, we, we attack the problem, as you say, from, from three different directions, relying on different moment restrictions and, and we get the same answer or very similar answers. And that's how we kind of see um, uh, the, the approach we've taken uh, fitting together. I mean, I think all the other suggestions uh, you made are, are, are really useful and, and fantastic. We are looking into thinking about different segments of uh, the market throughout the curve and sort of modeling the entire uh, inflation swap curve in in, um, in future work uh, something we're sort of working towards uh, now already and i think your point is is very well taken and that would be great um and i i apologize that our draft did not contain those supply and demand pictures i think they, they were great for the presentation they probably they should be in the paper we just had to revise it to include them because they make they make things uh, much, much clearer when you can see them. Well, thanks so much. Um, so um, let me, on behalf of organizers and the audience, thank all um, speakers and, and um, uh, discussants. Uh, so please, if you are, haven't already subscribed, subscribe to our emails. There will be another thematic um, conference coming up. Uh, we do not have a date yet. Um, neither, we are deliberating the um, theme as well. Um, but if you subscribe, you will get a notification. So hopefully that would be also, you can join the next one as well. Uh, thanks again.